I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents, the HRO Art of Life show. The title of this show is To Margaret with Love. And the Margaret to whom we refer is Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs, who needs no introduction because she has left a legacy that will never be forgotten and probably never be excelled. I have some of her closest friends with me today so that we can do some ruminating and reflections on our dear, beloved Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. And I have with me Queen Mother, Reverend Sinclair, <laughs> Reverend Helen Sinclair. Thank you, ma'am. Who was with her for eons as they traveled back and forth to the various correctional centers and served an inmate population who remembers her still and whom Reverend Sinclair still serves. And then of course we have Eleanor Chapman who traipsed all around the globe with Dr. Burroughs. One, one, once I think I traipsed with them and, um, and uh, was her, her traveling friend as well as her close friend and confidant uh, uh, Eleanor Tratman, Chatman of Africa Travel Advisors, the lady who takes people all over the world so that they can become familiar with other cultures. Exactly. And Diane Dinkins Carr, who for years and years was the president of the board of directors of the Southside Community Arts Center. Yes. And I think there's no such thing as being an ex-anything once you take on this kind of work because you may not have the official title and you may not do all of the duties, but somehow you still get called upon and you still find yourself in the same environs that you were in when you had a position. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> Did I call it right? That is so right? true, yes. Okay, so we brought along some things. I brought my book, uh, Journey with Margaret, the official autobiography of Dr. Mar Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. Um, and I have a couple of things in here that I want to share. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, others have brought. What did you bring? Well, Margaret used to do these little sample books, mm -hmm. and she used to pass them out, and these were like little fundraisers sometimes to raise money for Southside Community Arts Center, or even when she went to the jail for the prisoners. Like on this one, it says a donation um, for art supplies to teach the prisoners. So the one I'm gonna read from is my philosophy. Okay, we'll read from her philosophy. That's a good place yes. to start. So I'm gonna start now? Yeah, of course Okay, you're great. Start it says, I reject and ignore all things, ideas, people, etc., who are negative, I do not allow them to enter my aura. Age is nothing but a number. You are as old as you feel. If you keep your mind active, your body will stay young. The only things that grow old are clothes and you can always discard them and buy new ones. If you don't move it, you lose it. But the one that's very interesting in this um, little book is, what will your legacy be? How will your life help those who come after you? Will your legacy be a silent, decaying, great tombstone? Or will it be an ins inspiring painting, or a poem, or a play, or a novel to remind people that you lived? Decide at this point what you wish your legacy to be. And begin right now to work towards it. Don't let anyone discourage you. Know ye that money or the acquiring of it is not the most important goal in life. The most important goal in life is 
service to humanity. I wish to make, to, I wish to make the world more beautiful and better just because I'm in it. Wherever your life's work is to be, it should be something that helps to serve humanity and to improve the conditions of life. And for those now and who come after you, God, with, go with God and the God spirit is with you. What is your legacy? Well, you know, whenever I saw her during the la later years, she had one of those. She would put it in your hand yes. and make you feel so guilty as you began to examine yourself to try to figure out what this legacy was that you were going to leave behind. But that she kept that forward. She kept putting that on your mind. Think about your life. Think about what it is your life you are doing with your time. Think about service to others, you know. And she lived her legacy, she lived her philosophy. I think we could all agree she was authentic. These were not just things that she said because she was a poet and a writer and she could say flowery things. She said these things and lived these things. And she was exactly. always for service for humanity. At all times. Yes. 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 One Ellen, of the things is ahead. that I think she really wrote it a lot for the fellows who were behind the walls because she's saying it's not the money or anything that you leave. And then she inspired brothers that you're behind the walls, but you can leave a legacy also. And that was the, the last year, that was what she had them read in every prison that we went in. Because it's not, see people think you're behind the walls, that's the end of your life. But she was letting them know it's not. So there are some brothers who you know, have published books, poetry, art, everything, because she was there. And then on top of that, the reason she was with me for the last 25 years, she said she wanted to keep my mother's legacy alive, Ma Houston. She said, I'm gonna help you keep Ma's legacy alive. So that's how, why she was with me. Well, you know, when I had you on my show before, mm -hmm. I called it Iconology, the next generation, because <laughs> I knew that you were carrying on your mother's legacy, but in so doing, you have created your own legacy which is a wonderful thing. Thank you are you. still behind the walls. You still go every week or how often now? Well, we go, you know, we, we go uh, every week, but we go other times in, in February, we go almost every day because we try to get to every prison and take them their history. What do you mean Black every history. prison? Every prison in Illinois? Well, you know, we, we, had, we had 28, which we had 28 days and we were able to do two a day. They've added a few, <laughs> but we leave home on, on Sunday on the train and we go to Carpendale and, and when we get to Carpendale we visit every prison there, Big Muddy, Pinckneyville, Shawnee, Vianna, the boot camp, Menard, and they have two way down, Lawrence, and they're way, way, way away from us, but we go to all of those. And the next week we go to the Springfield area, Lincoln, Logan, Jacksonville, Taylorville, every prison that's in that area. The next week we go west, Hill and <laughs> East Moline and every every one of those. We used to be, we used to include the juveniles until they split up. But those brothers that come out now, they say, when you all came through and told us who we were, it changed our lives. I think the I think the work that you're doing is so commendable. It it's is. such fulfilling work too, because I can see it keeps you young, it keeps you alert and active, and it's good to see you. Reverend Sinclair. Yeah, well, it's just a little more than people think when you walk through a yard and 500 young men say, God bless you. That's, oh. that's pretty. <laughs> you say, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> it's, right. Right. it's just, it just does something for when me. When I was doing some of that kind of work, the hard part for me was leaving. Mm -hmm. I was so glad to come and I know that they greet you. I mean, they, they are so happy when you come and you feel so wonderful about coming and they're there. Mm -hmm. And then you have to leave them. And that's the hard part because you know that, you know, they you left something with them. That they yeah, didn't well, it, it, was, it was hard <laughs> on me. But the thing is, if you've been doing it for 25 years, then you know what you're doing is benefiting them even when you have to leave them there. Mm -hmm. And so it's a wonderful thing to have you as a real model. Thank you, ma'am. Have mm -hmm. a lot of those. At Eleanor Chapman, you know what? 
when I went with you to Senegal, Senegal. You, you and Dr. Burroughs and the group to Senegal. 1993. Was that that long ago? And I don't care much for flying. I don't like to. <laughs> but I figured if Margaret Burroughs was on that plane, it was going to stay in the air. <laughs> I mean, I just figured that. But you made, that was such, that was a flawless journey from beginning to end. We didn't worry about anything. You took care of everything. And I, if we had any problems, you didn't tell us. I can't recall you having any. I can't. I mean, it seemed to me we <laughs> met at the airport. We flew to Rome and then we were in Rome and then we went to look at some stuff and then we were on another plane and we went to Senegal and we kissed the ground because we were so glad to be home. <laughs> and then we were off and running. But it was you a made fantastic you, tour. I believe uh, <coughs> that was sponsored in conjunction with WVON Radio. I don't remember them having anything to do with our trip. They were. They it, were this there. was a this was an acquaintance tour or something that you were doing. Familiarization tour. I recall okay. now. I okay. thought it was uh, WVON when you mentioned Rome. Okay. It was the first one. But I remember. I still have photos of that particular uh, tour. Oh. And I thinking with Dr. Burroughs and I went over over thirty years, I think almost fifty trips together. Really? Yes. Uh, because she would say, Where are we going? Where are you going? And I'm going too. So oh, you average at least two a year, at least for over thirty years. That's a lot of togetherness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I see Dr. Burroughs as a very how can I say, multifaceted person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, looking through these books, I th thought about this, like for instance, and we're going to talk about her philosophy more. How many people know she wrote a cookbook? I didn't. The Recipes oh. of Africa. Yeah, I was looking at uh -huh. her yesterday. She wrote I, a somebody cookbook. gave me a lot of squash. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out how to cook the squash. <laughs> and she, she sat down and did this book. I think I've had it about. This was also done in 1993. Mm -hmm. Okay. A cookbook and she goes for each country, well, what's their national dish or something oh. that she particularly like. So no, very few people are aware of this. And then she, going with the little handbooks, mm -hmm. here's one she did, My Quest. And she starts with where she was born in, what, New Rose, Louisiana. Louisiana. Uh -huh. And how they went of the family coming north, going to school. Uh, until she comes to the end, not the end, and she says, we saw things with new eyes, but just because the journey mm -hmm. from Louisiana to Chicago. And she tells about her family and the challenges and the wonderful times they had. Mm -hmm. So I see so much of her. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you mentioned what uh, should I tell my children who are black? And of course, uh, there's so many more. Mm -hmm. She did, did a book on Chicago. I thought I had bought, uh, but and she mentions um, her experiences in Chicago. And uh, at the end of it, I'm sorry I didn't bring that. Uh, she says, "But no, I, I love you." She didn't make it rosy. Uh, mm -hmm. but I love you, and mm -hmm. she spoke of it. So people just mo many people think of her as just an, as an artist. Other people think of her as um, a writer. But she had so many things going for her. I just found out maybe five or six years ago how much sculpture she had done. Really? Yes. I'm sure that's why she was uh, with your daughter. Right. Uh, that she had done sculpture and um, uh, working with crafts. The Gloss print she and, started yeah. doing so everybody could afford to have yes. art. Mm -hmm. Right. And she would walk up to you and just give you a print. You yes. know, there are people she all over the world would just give give her work to you. You know, we've gone back to places all over the world and go into actually some hotels, mm -hmm. and they have put her prints up. Oh, wonderful. or in the homes. Mm -hmm. uh, one time we were in Cuba, and we walked into this person's office, and had she he had framed uh, one of her prints she had given him. Mm -hmm. Same thing in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, in 2010, she had given him, <coughs> um, excuse me, um, a print each time mm -hmm. she was there, and he had put them up. So you can check, wherever you go where she's been, you'll find a print. 
You're right that she's multifaceted, but she was such, you know, this may be a cliche or something, but she was such a great human being. And the thing was that she was so, so regular that you, you didn't start to realize who this great woman was until way after you'd known her for, she was my high school teacher at DuSable High School. I wasn't very good at art, but Ramon Price was. <laughs> we were, we yeah. were classmates. He was very good, I was not very good. She didn't make a distinction, she just taught us all. And I, my head was someplace else, so I didn't learn what Ramon learned to do. Or maybe he had natural talent. But sure. the thing was that when I became a teacher, and I knew that she was starting this museum in her living room. Then I took my classes to the museum. And I remember that one of the students was disappointed because I had also taken them to the other museums. And these were big, giant right, structures. Yes. And she, this was just her, her living room where she had these, these artifacts. And then we put our little donation in a little container at the at the door you know to to help build the museum but it, it didn't I mean whatever do you know that whatever she did was all right it never occurred to me that this was something rare and extremely unusual that this woman had started a museum in her living room. Yeah. She tried to make me start one of them before she left. She said, Take that couch out of your elephants. You and she <laughs> wanted me to turn my house into a museum. She was creative to the nth degree because she could see, as you said, make, thinking of making a cookbook, she could see things to do with other things right. you know she could when we traveled i learned to travel with her because she said don't fill up your suitcases <laughs> leave did. some room did. leave some room to bring things back and don't fill them with things for your personal use take some things to give to people whoever thought of that when you, go on a, when you go on a vacation, you pack all your outfits so you can change clothes as often as you like. You're not thinking about the people who are there. You think about, I'm going over here and I'm going to have this and do this and I'm going to buy these things and I'm going to bring them back. You know, but Dr. Burroughs took things to give to people always, in the countries always. where she went. She's a very giving person. Absolutely. And you know what she taught me? to put things in perspective. Things that once upon a time I would have been concerned about. And she would say, don't worry about it. Or compare it to something else and you say, she's right. And I, she had a favorite expression when you discuss something or something didn't go right. Mm -hmm. She would just tell it where to go, you know, and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, she did not Gossip say, so, be it. so be it, so be it. So be it. Sometimes you say, so be it. But, just, we, mm -hmm. we know, and, and, but she meant it. And even now, I was talking with your daughter, uh, something will come up and I'll be thinking, well, I, should I do this or what have you? And then she says, oh, chap, j just go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Just do it. And she was uh, making you stop and think about a lot of things. What I couldn't stand a lot was, why did she think, that she should call me mama, and she was older than me. Well, that's respect. <laughs> mama, where we gonna eat today? She called me mama. Where we gonna go? I said, oh no, you said, where we gonna eat? You tell me. I said, oh no, I want somebody else. I'm not the leader. <laughs> she would call me mama. But the thing, mm -hmm. the other thing is she would drive with me everywhere, and I don't care how lost we got. She said, I can't help you, but I'm with you. Mm -hmm. We'd be all over the United States trying to find a prison. Putting things in perspective again. <laughs> she never drove, did she? Yeah, yeah she, she, she did. did. I never she saw did. her. I think, I think her husband lost her car. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah Charlie lost the car Charlie in the parking lot. But yeah. I never stopped her. She was walking down the street getting on buses. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. She stopped riding with those well, cars. One time she had that. a driver with... Um, the park district. The park she was district. with the, a commissioner mm -hmm. with yeah. the park district. For so many years she had a driver. 
And then she would just call people who drove like me. Yeah, yeah. she <laughs> called me and yeah, said, yeah. pick me up or bring me home. Yeah, not, right. yeah. What you well, if you saw coordinate. her somewhere, you knew to inquire how she was getting home. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because nobody was going to go off and leave Dr. Burroughs right. anywhere. No. But she loved on Saturdays going to the, um, the resale shop. That, and we went every Tuesday. She was, yeah. We were talking about that. 159th in uh, Harlem. She yeah, said, it must she be was. Tuesday. We had goodwill. And then there was one on um, right off of Cottage Grove before they tore down. No, they made that building condos. Okay. It was like a, to me, like a big garage sale. And she would have her shopping cart walking down Michigan mm -hmm. to Persian Road over Persian Road to Cottage. Mm -hmm. And then you might see a That's a long there. walk. Oh, but she, she said she can do it. She had her shopping cart and she was going, it was like a storage warehouse. But they had turned it I into... I know where that place was. Oh, that's was. beautiful, yeah. I know, I know where I know when they it did was that. Off, yes, you're right. Cottage Grove, right Grove. off like that was a beautiful 39th place. and a half yeah, and 40th. round over in there. Yeah, right mm -hmm. off of Drexel. Yeah, somebody had to tell you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me tell you a story uh, that uh, occurred between the two of us when I took her to Salvation Army. Uh, it was the fair at South Shore Cultural Center where Deborah was giving her the the carving, mm -hmm. and she wanted something new, or no something. So we went to Salvation Army, and I kept showing her things, and she, mm, and this is nice. Mm. I said, what's wrong? Hey, too expensive. I said, In the Salvation well, Army. You haven't heard the punchline yet. Okay. I said, this is only $5. She said, I know, but where I go, I could get it for three. <laughs> I ended up buying her outfit. I think I spent about seven, eight dollars. Mm -hmm. She wore because she was not going to spend that five dollars. I know, it was. I know. I knew of her fondness. I meant to go and get her, but I never did get to do it. I meant to go and get her and spend the day just going to the different thrift stores because I knew she liked to do that. But I also know that she used to go buy stuff for other people. Oh yes, and yes, take it yes. to the shelters for women and stuff like that. You know. And she would take your things and give them to someone. <laughs> you don't need a good, I'm, I'm going to give this, this, this. No, I want more. It was gone. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. You, mm -hmm. you don't need it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, she also had the philosophy that if you didn't need it, don't buy it. You know, like some people shop. Some people go to the store and they buy stuff because they want to get some more shoes or yeah. they want to get some stuff. other stuff. But Dr. Burroughs will say, if you don't need it, don't buy it. Mm -hmm. So I have a friend who was a friend, you know, who very familiar with Dr. Burroughs. And I was trying to go spend some coupons. I'm famous for the coupon thing. And she said, you know what Dr. Burroughs said? She said, if you don't need it, don't buy it. So sometimes when I buy things, I think about that. And I realize that I really don't have to have this. I really don't need it. But she was very, she, she invested her money. She didn't spend her money. She invested, invested it. The, whatever she bought was worth what she paid for it. Mm -hmm. And she did not duplicate stuff and buy up a whole bunch of stuff. But look at what she left. Look at her legacy. Look at the DuSable Museum, Museum. and mm -hmm. the Southside Community Arts Center and all the various programs that she left I'm sure at Stateville right there are still programs that are operating that that mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. She, she she ran so you know she she made a good investment of her life but one thing she told me mama you can paint and so at 65 my daughter said my mama done turned into grandma Moses <laughs> I paint every day now do you every day I have so much, good I have so much in my house she said, Mama, you can paint. And what else she tell me? I've been in the class with, you can write here, you write something. I write poetry and I paint because I had to. And I was surprised that I could do it. Well, you know, she would encourage you and she would help you. Mm -hmm. She would not just give you advice, yeah. but she would help you do. At one time, I was publishing a newspaper. I didn't mean to t publish a newspaper. <laughs> I meant to publish a newsletter. Uh -huh. But I met somebody in New York, and I sent what I had to him, and he sent me back a newspaper, mm -hmm. and I liked it. So I kept doing that. And for a long time, the newspaper was mostly 
contributions of essays from people behind the walls. Right. And it was a forum for them. They took great pleasure mm -hmm. in sending things that they had written. I took great pleasure in editing and, and, and printing those things. But I, you know, she kept telling me that I needed to give this a place, you know, because I was doing, I was still doing operating out of my right. uh, my living room and wherever else in the house I could stack up all this stuff. But she kept encouraging me to get a place. I tried. I didn't succeed in doing it. She succeeded in moving out of her house into buildings. I never succeeded in getting out mm -hmm. of my house into buildings, but she always believed in institution building. So she wanted me to give it a home. She wanted me to, to house it somewhere, but I just didn't see how I could do it. I didn't see how I could afford to, you know, pay uh, the expenses of another place, work on a job, run this, run <laughs> that. And, you know, I never told her I couldn't do it. Because you couldn't tell Dr. Burr you couldn't do <laughs> no, something. You couldn't. She didn't yeah. want to hear it. Because she did everything. Yeah. You look foolish telling somebody who does everything yeah. that you can't do some small thing. So, you know, to think that we had, had the privilege of being on this planet at the same time she was on this planet, she, had, she was such a balanced person, wouldn't you agree? I, I, did she ever get angry? Did she? No. I, no. She no. didn't have emotions she, like that's people. That's when she would use that expression. She would not get angry and mm -hmm. and case closed, book closed, whatever well, she it was. Well, she would get upset when they would do something to her at the prison. Well, they just ought to tell me if they don't want me here. They should just tell me because they would do all kind of stuff. You know, they put her out all the time. Really? Oh yeah, they didn't know who she they didn't know, Like they said, John F. Kennedy they said, we didn't know who you were. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who she was. Till they start seeing in the paper and stuff. Yeah, they were pretty mean. But even at prisons. that, it wasn't a lasting anger. No. That's what I mean. She would express herself. She wouldn't keep. Oh, it in. she was candid and <coughs> honest mm -hmm. to the, you know, to the bone. When they say we were talking about how she likes to spend, save on money. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, she was the most giving person I know. Uh, tuition, college tuitions. Really? Uh, she would take people to Africa. She was really wanting every African American to go back to Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, she would take couples and pay their way. And she wanted them to have that experience. I think each of her grandchildren sons she took to Africa. Uh, she you think she was them. spending there, what you call inheritance? Yes, what she said. That's <laughs> right. right. She would say that, yeah. Right. So she was just uh, particular how she spent her money. She wasn't going to pay $5 for a skirt at, no, right. Salvation Army, but she'll pay your tuition. Well, I know of at least one funeral she paid for, mm -hmm. you know, and this was not a relative. Mm -hmm. This was somebody we both knew, mm -hmm. and I discovered that she didn't tell me. Yeah. She didn't go around saying, you know, I did such and such, you should do such and such. She just did what she was going to do, and I think when she saw a need, she met the need, yeah. you know, and I just, you know, I I don't know how you grew up to be like a Dr. Margaret Taylor Gosborough. She's one of a kind. Yes, I have a painting from one of the, the students, I'm talking students from state prison, and it's made like, did you say a puzzle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Of Dr. Burroughs, it's a puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. A beautiful, I wish I had brought it, uh, like you said, the, the puzzle was there, but it was still complete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what he, I know that's what he was expressing in his art when he said, no, she was a, what can you say? Yeah, she, she is, was, but she's functioning. She's a whole. Right, right. It, I, I tell and you. And then she also bowled and roller skated. Yes. On top of going to the prison. And Talk about always, that. Always yeah. at Southside Community Arts Center. Right. In she fact, she would get people from the bowling alley to travel mm -hmm. to Africa. She, and then when they win, they'd, she'd treat us to breakfast on the way to the prison. And we won last night, she would say. She said, I'm the worst one in there, but we still won. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when I, I learned that she was going regularly, like every week. Every Friday. To go mm -hmm. skating. Every Friday. And here I was. I skated as a younger person. But I just, when I went to birthday parties of, you know, my grandchildren and whatnot, and I saw these people whizzing around, I thought, I'm not going out there because mm -hmm. I don't want to get knocked down and trampled and what have you. Dr. Burroughs went every week 
and yeah. she skated yeah, and she boy. bowled and she she how did you know you say I don't have time how do you have find time she said here you must use it or you'll lose it yep <laughs> you know but they're not, you, you know the it. hours in the day you know you're painting you're sculpting you're you're uh, going to the prisons you're going running in and out of the kids Mm -hmm. oh, she had 17 cats. <laughs> cats. She had to attention. I didn't know how many cats she I, had. I, think I knew she had cats. They were probably more than 17. They were able to count 17. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing was that she did all these, and she never seemed rushed to me. I never, never mm -hmm. I never felt like she was in a hurry to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you if you were with her, it you just it'll get done. It was just a leisurely thing. It was not. It, there was no urgency. So, you know, she kept secrets because I don't know if I didn't know how to do that, but Dr. Burroughs. No, I wish she would share them. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, trying to pack that all that into a life, into a day, into a month. You know, that you can, and then she went, she, social justice. She, she fought, she marched, she campaigned, she picketed. She did. And she wrote letters, too. If she found out your so, organization needed money, she, yes. she would write those, send those letters out 50 and 60 at a time saying, you must support Southside Community Arts Center. You oh, yeah. must support Tusaba Museum. And then we just start getting these checks. Yeah, checks. Or she would say, we want to acquire such and such a yes. piece yes. and send you a picture of it. Yes. Say, we, this costs this much. We want to buy this. We went on a trip, I can't recall the destination now, and she took some photographs, just of us doing various things. Then she uh, composed this letter and sent it to many people asking for a donation for a copy of one of the photographs. <laughs> <laughs> and they sent it to her. She was enterprising. Yeah, she, she was. was. But the thing was, you supported Dr. Burroughs because she, it was never for self. She True. was never raising money to do any personal thing. That's it was true. always on behalf of a greater cause. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you refuse to do something when somebody is not, they're not asking you to do anything for, for themselves? She took care of herself. As far as I can tell, she did that pretty Very much well. single-handedly after after um, Mr. Burroughs passed yes, on Gerald. you know yeah. she she stayed in that great big old house Lord what must the heating bill have been in oh, that big place yes yes you know but she she maintained herself she did not have a tin cup <laughs> she no. was not she was not uh, she was she didn't ask you for anything for herself that's true and, and, and she found novel ways. She told me that when I had uh, this newspaper and some other things that I was doing, because I used to like to have uh, symposia, I'd like to have invite speakers and do projects. And so she told me that I should sell memberships. I should have people join my non-for-profit organization and pay a membership. And, th and she had it all laid out for me. She said, and then you give them a discount when you have one of your programs, and they, they get to come to the program at a discounted price. And she, she could tell you how to do what you were doing. And if you would do what she told you to do, you could do it. Well, I you mean, know, there it, are it lots of museums that she helped to start all oh, over yes. the world, other than that one. And the other museum, museum. Yeah, they, yeah. Would, they would call on Many her. of them. Are. I know in Malawi, when she went there, they asked her to come back. and she, she went with me to Malawi. I said I was going. She said, well, I'm going too. That's how she, she I and remember. I, and I wasn't trying to take anybody. I just knew I was going back to see my, my children. That and didn't so matter. when she said that, and also Georgine said, well, I'm going to go too. I said, okay. I said, well, be sure you all bring flashlights. So they packed up and came with me. And then when they got there and they had to go outside to the toilet, they said, what? I, they said, now that's why she had us bring. I said, you all didn't ask me what was going to happen. You just said you wanted to go. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> you got to go outside. I heard about that on her Get return. Get your flashlight. <laughs> it, was, it was an experience. She enjoyed it. But yeah, she, but she loved she my family. That she was so, so, she said, I see why you like to come back over here. Their house is beautiful and the children just love you. I said, I, I love them. They seem to know me better than the kids here. 
It's something about people in Africa, it seems. I, I can understand. They that. know me better. They know what I like. They mm -hmm. don't have as many diversions. But, and they, and they, they concentrate, can concentrate on you. They concentrate on the people right. more. Because mm -hmm. on 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 like on my basis. birthday, the, the young man I called my son, um, he was a Zulu. He danced. I said, my children would never would have known that he danced. I said, you couldn't give me anything better than that. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a birthday cake I had never seen. I said, you don't put 65 candles on cakes in America. <laughs> <laughs> they coming at a cake with 65 candles. I like to faint it. And Dr. Burroughs had a passion regarding people going to Africa. Almost an obsession. She knew they needed to. Yeah, they really do. And it's, we've said it so many times in so many ways. If you don't have your roots or you're not knowledgeable, you're going to perish. Mm -hmm. And just from day to day things, it's very, very important. I think I have that passion now. Mm -hmm. Just to know who you are, not Africa, uh, but even if you're from India, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Jewish people do this very well. Mm -hmm. They have organizations, anyone who wants to go to Israel can go to maintain. But I, I understand why. we. The man, I shouldn't say the man, done a very good job of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see the good in Africa. Right now, Africa has the fastest growing middle class population than anyone else on earth. Really? Yes. And it's very simple if you understand. It's the, we know it's the richest continent. Mm -hmm. They are just keeping some of their own wealth mm -hmm. and not shipping it off. Very smart. Uh, educational levels in some smaller countries, their literacy rate is higher than that of the United States. Mm -hmm. And we don't hear things like that. Uh, we've been made to feel ashamed. Uh, how many happened to watch last night, uh, Many Rivers to Cross? I haven't seen it. I've got to report it. Let me share this with you. Uh, he was saying, you know, during the slavery period, you always saw the happy black and you trust uh, your children with these people, and they were just good in words, you know, just good whatever. But the minute slavery was discontinued, and the blacks started doing well, he became a demon. You didn't see the good blacks anymore. You mm -hmm. saw all the bad things that he was doing. Mm -hmm. So this would stop his progress, but before then he was a good boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and put this image, this negative image out, which is still being perpetrated now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for no other reason, just to know who you are. And it's the most beautiful continent there is. Well, I can attest to that. I can tell you that I was telling my daughter just recently about some customs that they just have. When you mentioned Zulu, you made me think of Elkin Satoli, who was one of my professors and later my colleague. He was Zulu, and he said that he could, any city he went to, he could open up a phone book, and if he saw Satoli in the phone book, he could call that person up they would come and get him, mm -hmm. they would house him, they would take care of him, and he could stay as long as he wanted. Now, how many people do you know from our community that if they find themselves in a strange city, they can go look up their last name in the phone book and somebody immediately, because they know you're a member of their kinship group, immediately they take care of you. That was one of the things. You learn how to be human from African people. The other thing was... Right now, but we were doing that when my mama was, was here. When, you know, when, when I was a little girl, they were doing that. Because really? everybody, yeah, yeah, people came all from Arkansas and everything. They just all came to each other's house and stuff. But they, but they were it, people man. that they knew, weren't well, they? Well, they just knew. Well, this, from, you didn't have to know these Arkansas, people. No, if you was from Arkansas, I guess okay. it was. I okay. guess my family well, like from little, Africa. Uh, my family, uh, my maiden name is Scretchens. Mm -hmm. And we've had family reunions, you know, all over the United States. And every time I go to a different city, and if I see the name, it's a relative, and we're happy to see each other. And that's I was thinking about that. Yeah, we, right. used to, we lost this some of our The other thing was when there's the a death people. in the family, mm -hmm. everybody runs to contribute. Yes, yes. 
There's no stigma. Nobody says, well, that's their relative. They can't mm -hmm. pay for the food. What? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no stigma. There's no alarm. There's no gossiping. You go to contribute because the community is the community's insurance. You don't have insurance policies. You have each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so when Dr. Satole's sister or wife, I've forgotten which one it was, passed away, of course they had to go back to Africa and all of that. People were running. If you don't, get, if you don't contribute, that means that you are at odds with the family. You don't want that because the family is going to come to your aid when you need Correct. something. So everybody runs to make their contribution so that they can help do what needs to be done. That's amazing because we have to, we have to ask people to help. You know, we have to let people know that this family lost a son and he was 15 and they didn't have insurance and the family may need some help. But I think most societies do, with the exception of the Westerners. You go to the Orient they and do other it. places. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but when you get to the Western world, it's different. I think it has a lot to do with it. You know, taking up a collection, what? Take up a collection. Where do you go to give the money? You know, that's what you want to find out. Where do you, oh, there's a, the fa well, in the rural South, which mm -hmm. is, essentially where I'm from, although I'm a, from, from a city near the rural south. Mm -hmm. If somebody's barn or house burned down, the community went and rebuilt the house. If somebody had a baby, the women went over and helped the mother take care of the other children and take care of her household until she was able to be on her feet and do or the, do these things. So you're right. Most it is. It home. is. It is the Western. I don't like to call it a culture. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's the Western. It's the Western custom for it to be nuclear families mm. and you know the individuals and and folks who think that you know if it, it, that's her children. You know, mm -hmm. she should take care of her children. You know, well, that this goes is way not back in history, thousands of years. It was cold up there in Europe and places. <laughs> had now you're gonna try to find I, I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm okay. laughing. It's serious. Okay. They had. They were very protective of things, and they didn't couldn't go out like in Africa, a, in any place in Asia, and pick something up off a tree. It was so bad. Or go fishing and get mm -hmm. something. So I would imagine over the centuries you would develop a sort of a self-protectiveness attitude. We have, we have refugee camps where we don't have that kind of behavior. It's, it's not need. You know when we were in Senegal. You book. know when we were in Senegal they had that blackout. And you couldn't, you could only see the cars on the streets were the only lights and the generators in the hotel. Yeah. And you know they didn't have a crime wave. Don't you remember? That's right, but don't scare people. That didn't happen that often. But what I'm, I'm, I'm joking. But what I, no, but what I'm, what I'm saying is yeah. there was not a crime wave. Yeah. Could you have had the lights out in downtown Chicago? No. No, for I'm days on end? I'm agreeing with you. I was just saying why I think that's so. But I'm saying Africans do not necessarily uh, uh, turn into some kind of uncivilized people out of need. You no, know, I not being able to pick Africa. the fruit off the tree or fish out of the water is not, and not, uh, not no, just the the reason why people become come uh, antisocial. No, I wasn't speaking of Africans becoming okay. that way. I said Westerners because of their environment. But I'm saying that when Africans are deprived, they don't become uncivilized. They don't. Because, it, yeah, because it's, uh, they don't behave they that way. Say, we uh, saw it. They still have a certain amount of freedom, and they have a certain amount of humanity. Yes. Yes. Humanity. But Dr. Burroughs, this is to, to me. I'm. We're still talking about her because we're talking yes, about yeah. her her yes. ethic. Mm -hmm. Dr. Burroughs not only loved you, but she loved your children. When she met my daughter, my daughter. Born Dr. Burroughs like it was me that passed away. I'm and sure. I told people, 
I said, you know, I'm just trying to comfort my daughter because she lost her mother. Because Dr. Burroughs treated her like she was her child. She was not just an artist that she wanted to encourage, you know, and, and, and give a, you know, give a helping hand. But she loved her and she treated her. Now, that's a wonderful thing when somebody not only loves you, but then they go to the next generation and love your children. <laughs> well, I think it's because she loved herself. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you don't have self love, you're secure. You did she know way. your children, Reverend Sinclair? Oh yes, ma'am. Did she? <laughs> oh. Did she adopt them too? Oh yeah, all my kids. And my yeah. grandchildren. Uh -huh. And your grandchildren. My children and grandchildren. Mm hmm. Cause she just she loved who you loved. Mm. Well, did she, she love your husband? Well, she introduced my parents, so she had to love me <laughs> <laughs> and my sister. That's oh, and she loved my husband too. Did well, yeah, she? she introduced my parents. Go That's so it wasn't right. For okay. Dr. Burroughs. Excuse yeah. me. Cut. Was it her idea that they should meet so that they could know each other and become? Yes. Okay. And, and here you I are. <laughs> here you are. So she, she, she was, as you say, she was a giving person. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else you could ask so anybody to give. Did we have a break? Yes, ma'am. We can. Oh, have a break can we fade now. to black, please? <laughs> There we go. We go to the little girl's room. Go ahead. Oh. She made me drink so much water. Yeah, she doesn't drink enough water. I had it in water today. No what? Well, Eleanor, you should have called me. <laughs> Wait a minute, you got to get that off yeah. of her. That's the golden side. Come this down. Look at you on the and let it let it slide. When does down. Deborah come? What? Deborah does a meeting place. That's one of the other things. When um, I I became politically active in independent politics on the west side during my early adulthood and um, Dr. Burroughs had gatherings of, of various kinds and among these gatherings she had um, a writer's workshop that, that one or more of the people who were in the groups that I was in attended. And I went there and Frank London Brown was the up and coming one who was you who had gained fame, he had written a book called Trumbull Park about a black family that had moved into, oh. uh, I think it may have even been public housing, but it was in a predominantly white neighborhood. And they put a, a snake in the mailbox and traumatized and terrorized the people and so forth and so on. So he had written this book that could, you know, fall under the rubric race in America, you know. And so now he was going to New York to be on the Today Show. but. Dr. Burroughs knew everybody that was doing everything. I met Oscar Brown Jr. at her house. She had all, Gwendolyn Brooks, she had no, all I these people. Wrong. She had such wonderful uh, friends, friends, friends and colleagues. Yes. You know, she just, uh, either she aligned herself with them or they aligned she themselves with her. She also introduced Gwendolyn Brooks and to her husband. husband. Oh, she was truly a matchmaker. Match okay. <laughs> okay. 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 So she had all these great associates. And once she came to my house, I was having a housewarming. I did not think that the eminent Dr. Burroughs would come. And I don't know, I mentioned it or whatever. And I looked up and here she came up the walk and she had three or four people with her, all of whom were, were famous folks. And they came in, and it was almost over, but they came in and we sat around my dining room table and I was mute because these people were so brilliant and so well informed and so up to date on what was going on in the world mm -hmm. that I dared not show my ignorance because I didn't know what was going on anywhere but in the city of Chicago, and I didn't know, I only knew the things that we were struggling mm -hmm. against, that, that you know, but I didn't, I just didn't know the fabric of the city. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Burroughs associated herself with people who were alive and who were informed and who and were she shared, engaged. she shared that knowledge mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. Can I, uh, there was, was about five or six years ago, no longer than that, New Year's Day, she said, well, you've got to have a heartbreak party. What? I said, a heartbreak party? What is that? Heartbreak Day is the first of the year 
That was the day that the slaves were sold to new owners or going someplace else. Oh. And that's where the, the watch service came from. They would stay up all, new, all night, New Year's Eve, watching to see who was going to come and be taken to be sold. And the, on the first of the year, they were taken, and this was called Heartbreak Day. So I've had a number of Heartbreak Days at my home. Can I come to the next yes, one? Yes, and we see we, uh, we literature. Um, Willie Lynch, we go over his thing, mm -hmm. just sit around, drink wine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very emotional thing uh, uh, just to be there and uh, read poetry and share things mm -hmm. and uh, on Heartbreak Day. Yeah. I mean, just things like that. I wouldn't have known about that. Right. And well, she says that. About that. Yeah. Huh? She was there. She would come. The first one I had, every time she was in town, she would come. And I just invite people, have food, and we sit around and talk and about Heartbreak Day and our ancestors. And you know, that's so important because we have never really grieved. Exactly. You know, when people write these books about post-traumatic slavery syndrome and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. The one thing is that no healing can take place unless the grieving process has been engaged. Mm -hmm. And we just try to walk around like it never laid a glove on mm -hmm. it, us. Yes, mm -hmm. it did. Mm -hmm. It laid a powerful glove. That glove penetrated through all the layers. And that glove laid, a, the, the, the glove actually engaged all of our inner selves you know so we do you we do i mean folks have the wailing wall you know people have the holocaust museum mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know they have all these things to remind see, them we've of been taught this. That that's bad that's ignorant don't do that why i said we've been taught that okay and that's why we don't do things just like uh i'll say shouting in the church mm -hmm. that's wrong but that's the type of expression that we do as a, as a group, as mm -hmm. a race. We, we're very vocal people, emotional people. Mm -hmm. But we've told that's, that's you don't do that, you sit like well, this. Well, Dr. Burroughs was as African as any woman could be, <laughs> you know, because um, if you want to do stuff about hair, that was your that was your problem. <laughs> you know, you, you deal with it because I'm not, she was not conforming to anybody's standard of beauty that said she had to, you know, do plastic surgery and all kind of foolishness. You she know, loved she, herself. She loved herself and she was who she was and she was a whole lot. She was several dozen people. I want to I wanna read this poem because I'm just so scared we're going to run out of time. I don't get to say what shall I tell my children. Yeah, and this is from her daughter. I think it's good, Oh, oh yes, yeah. Reverend, you're go ahead and read that one. Cause I'm yours just going to read up. some of it. Read all you want. <laughs> we have time. <laughs> Voices from Within by Gail Goss Hutchinson. I was telling uh, her niece about the, the poems that I have that this young lady had written in with her this sons. is her daughter's poem? Yeah, yeah poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The one, I, the part down here, if I don't read it all. Well, I can, I can start up here. This was her birthday. To my mother, while we can yet walk hand in hand and heart, how mysterious the tie that binds. Daughter to mother, mother to daughter. The same glue a bonding agent that separates the land from the ski, sea, the sky from the water the mysterious glue that emanated from God's first utterance when he created all from the original let there be out of the big bang and even before it opened up all possibility any possible condition be met even for prayers that haven't yet been prayed the mysterious glue and something more the mysterious glue to which I refer is love and the something more that tags us each one is the need to love under the sun when I was a child I so love your hands. That's the part I like. With long tapered fingers and skin so tan as a child, and even now I loved and love her hands. No more beautiful hands had I ever seen, a golden hue with tones of brown and skin as soft as velvety down. I held those hands in times of joy or fear or pain I did employ. The bond of love through holding her hands, the trust and faith which allows me to stand with confidence today and sing just a few of the songs a few of the songs within me that bring joy, that flow 
was rivers of waters ran run to the sea, so does the music flow in me. Yet I know from whence the rivers get their start, from God's all-loving heart. You may ask what's the mystery everyone knows about love, stated very simply. It flows and flows from God above. But the mystery is so much more, I say, that no one can know it all today, tomorrow or forever. Love ever growing and unfolding. Love creating, shaping, molding. That's just a part of it. That is beautiful. And I remember, that is beautiful. I remember that I had a, my house burned down. I don't remember years. And I had a house warming and everybody came. And my daughter said, Mom, there's a lady standing in there. Who is she? I said, I don't know. She said, I've never seen a lady look like her. Who is she? And it was Dr. Burr's daughter. I had never knew. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was at my birth. Yeah. yeah, she was there. I didn't know who she was. Because she just looked different from everybody else who was there. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's standing somewhere in a corner. And so uh, that was how I met her. And a lot of times it, uh, when Dr. Burr would go and speak, then all of the grandsons and, and her husband, we'd all go someplace and hear her speak. Mm -hmm. And um, so they asked her, would she come and help it push with the, with the education department? But they didn't have nothing for us to do. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, uh -uh, I'm going to prison with you. And so that was something we did on a regular basis. We're always going Cook County Jail, you know, Stateville, Dwight, everywhere. And she loved that. And, and then she could help them to learn to paint. And they got places all over the people that have opened up arts, art centers and th things like that because of her. In fact, I had 100 pieces right now that I've got to. One our key changing yeah, our work. keys, yes. Mm -hmm. I've got yeah. to do something with we're that. Gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna and do so something. all of them, you know, they're still we're gonna remember her birth I mean her uh, black history the first of February at Stateville every year. They put that in there, you know. And the other thing that used to really tickle me about her is she would look at handsome men and we'd be watching, man, you good looking and the people say, What you thought? She said, I, I may be dead but I ain't buried <laughs> <laughs> Or I'm gonna make I'm gonna make you my next husband. Yeah. <laughs> Are you married? Well, I'm sorry. Man, I was going to say you could be my fourth husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they you know, you might, since Diane is always going to be a part of the Southside Community Arts Center, mm -hmm. you might consider doing something with all this artwork that she has belonging to R. Key Cheney, you know, allowing, uh, work out something with R. Key. Yeah where his work can be sold and a part of it go yes. to the Southside Community mm -hmm. Arts yeah. well, Center. Yeah, well, they always, I always do that. I mean, right. I've done that okay. before. And one, and one of the uh, young ladies who's working out there, and now I heard the other day, she invited me to a um, art show, and she said it was, she was having to bid solid so auction on it. I think that's really the that. best way to do it mm -hmm. instead of putting a price mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Putting a, you know, a minimum and then let Because you know Dr. Burroughs would do something about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I got enough time to read this this well, why don't poem. You try? But I'm going to, but I want to tell you that in this, in her auto. Is that it? <laughs> they kept putting the minutes up there three that's minutes. The, that's the, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> the <laughs> theme song. You can't go so fast when you're having fun. <laughs> I know it. The illusion called by different names and this has served to just confuse us. When all is said and done, to be one's our revolution. We never stand alone, cause unity's our resolution. The motive is the message, a call for unity. Share one mind 